Today we answer the question, what do the state of Michigan and the television program Ancient Aliens have to do with one another? I'm Aiden Mattis, and Michigan still sucks. Many of the missing 401 cases we've discussed here are mysterious because of the way in which somebody died or the complete and total disappearance of an individual, but this is not one of those stories. This one, oddly enough, showed up on an Ancient Aliens episode about interdimensional beings and traveling through portals. This is one of the first times that I have come across David Politis being in something that is not made by David Politis, but in, in a season 13 episode of Ancient Aliens, he is brought in to talk about the case of Stephen Kabaki, who, as the story traditionally goes, walked out onto Lake Michigan about 200 yards and then completely vanished. There were tracks going all the way out onto the lake, there was no sign that the ice had shattered, cracked, anything like that. Stephen just left his skis and his backpack on the shore, walked out, and, you know, sucked into thin air. Was it aliens? Was it, you know, was this an abduction? Did he go through a dimensional rift? Like, what's, what's the question here? And... And the reason that there are so many questions is partially because of something that we'll get to in a minute, but I think that right now what we need to do is talk about today's sponsor, Factor. As you guys can imagine, it takes a lot of time to research and produce these videos every week. And if you talk to content creators, something you'll probably hear pretty often is that we don't really have a ton of time to cook our own food, and takeout tends to pile up really quick. That's why we're psyched to be partnering with Factor. Factor delivers restaurant quality meals to your door every week, and all you have to do is take it out of the box, put it in your freezer, and when it's time to eat, take it out of the freezer, microwave it for a couple of minutes, and you are good to go. And when I say it's restaurant quality, I'm not saying that because it was in the script. I'm saying that because I tried the first box of it when I was playing Call of Duty with the guys and couldn't shut up about how good it was. It was the tomato pesto chicken, by the way. It was phenomenal. And what's cool is that this isn't just picking from a simple generic menu. Factor has over 34 dishes that they offer, and the menu is changed and updated pretty regularly, so you never get bored. Like the reaction you see to me having the spicy poblano beef bowl on screen right now? First time I tried it. Magnificent. And another thing that you might know about us here at the Lore Lodge is that we're pretty serious about what we put into our bodies, pretty serious about ingredients. So I took a look at the Factor label. And if you look at the label on your Factor box, you're not going to see a whole bunch of Greco-Roman babble that looks like, you know, you're trying to read some sort of scientific dissertation. You're going to see real foods. This is honestly a game changer for me because I don't have a ton of time to cook for myself, I don't want to break the bank ordering takeout, and I do care about what goes into my body. If you think Factor could be right for you, head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code LOREDGE50, that's L-O-R-E-L-O-D-G-E-5-0, to get 50% off your first Factor box. So something that factors into this video is location. This story doesn't end on Lake Michigan. Stephen Kabaki, about age 23, was a student at Hope College studying history. Now, Hope College is a little liberal arts school situated in Holland, Michigan, about 25 miles southwest of Grand Rapids. Prior to European-American settlement in the region, the area belonged to the Ottawa people, and that is the same Ottawa as the city in Canada. Now, the Algonquin-speaking Ottawa people are cousins of Canada's Ojibwa people, as well as the Potawatomi people of Wisconsin. And their oral history suggests that at some point in the deep, distant past, they came from the Dawnlands, likely the east coast of the United States and Canada, and that was probably before they split from the main Ojibwe-speaking group. Working together with the Ojibwe and the Potawatomi, the Ottawa fought wars as the Council of Three Fires, often against the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois, or against the Dakota Sioux peoples. However, the first European explorer to encounter the Ottawa seems to have been Samuel de Champlain in 1613, and he described them as having pierced noses, many tattoos, painted faces, and primarily fighting with bows and arrows, simple buckler shields, and wooden clubs. While they are known for fighting a series of wars, the Ottawa were primarily traders. And the wars they did fight, like the Beaver Wars against the Mohawk in New York, were primarily over the fur trade. They were exceptional trappers and dominated the Great Lakes fur trade, which brought them into pretty close contact and often alliance with the French. And then when the Europeans began to fight each other, a lot of tribes took either the side of the British or the French during the Seven Years' War, also known, of course, as the French and Indian War when you talk about it in its uh, colonial context, the colonial theater. In the lead-up to that war, the Ottawa attacked the British-aligned Miami Indians and were pretty pretty brutal about it. Some stories suggest that they, in fact, ended up 
spoiling the Miami Chieftain alive and then eating him. Got that one from a just wonderful master's thesis that I read. When the skirmishes eventually developed into full-blown war, the Ottawa sided with the French being led by a half-French chieftain. However, France's defeat in that war left them under British control, and for a brief period they did try to resist under the chieftain Pontiac of the famous Pontiac's Rebellion. Pontiac was fighting mostly to prevent any more British expansion into the Ohio Valley and the Midwest, and he did so with limited success. His rebellion led to something called the Proclamation Line of 1763. Now, this was a problem for the natives, because no matter who won here, they were going to lose. And this decision by the Crown of England was actually pretty much the, the nail in the coffin, because what they had done was during the war, in order to entice American colonists to fight for the British Army, they had offered them land west of the Appalachians. However, the Proclamation Line of 1763, which again was partially a result of Pontiac's Rebellion, that, that made it so that American colonists couldn't settle west of the Appalachians. This created a problem where a whole bunch of Americans had risked their lives fighting for the British, and now the British were reneging on their promises. So it created a large degree of hostility between the colonists and the natives, and also a large degree of hostility between the colonists and the crown. All of this ended up leading up to the American Revolution. And when the American Revolution did come about, Ottawa chieftain Egushawa sided with the British, assuming that the much stronger, much larger British Empire would have no trouble dispelling these colonists. After all, they had just beaten France. If they could beat France, they've got to be able to beat their own colonists, right? Wrong. Because American colonists were very stubborn, and also the French helped. Thanks, guys. With their very powerful British allies gone, the Ottawa really didn't stand much of a chance against American expansionism, and eventually accepted treaties that moved their lands to Oklahoma. American expansion into western Michigan, the territorial lands of the Ottawa, however, was not immediate, and the first settlers who were white to actually get there lived pretty peaceably with the natives. A Protestant mission was established in Holland, Michigan by a Reverend George Smith, from Vermont, but he found that most of the people there were already Catholic, which was weird for him, but there wasn't a ton to be done between Catholic and Protestant. At the end of the day, they were both Christian and they just weren't really interested in becoming a different kind of Christian, but they had no problem with George Smith being there. Unfortunately, this peaceable arrangement between the natives and the new white settlers was not going to last because a group of Dutch Calvinists came in and settled the area in the 1840s. Specifically, that was 1847, which was about eight years after George Smith had started his mission. The Calvinists came into an area that was dominated by Catholicism and native traditions and immediately said, well, we're having none of this and basically told everybody that if they wanted to live in town, then they had to be Dutch Calvinists. So the Ottawa decided to skip town and go north to avoid Calvinism, which is an understandable reaction to Calvinism. Dutch heritage eventually became the primary cultural identifier of the town of well, Holland, which is now filled with over 170 churches, many tulip fields, and a few windmills. And of course, the small Christian school known as Hope College. And in 1978, Stephen Kabaki, a native of Deerfield, Michigan, and a 23-year-old history major, was finishing up his final semester there. It was February, he, got, he had three classes left, he was skating through, or skiing through. And he was an experienced cross-country skier, with his family telling investigators after he went missing that he had been skiing for at least several years, since he was 17 years old, and that he had both hiked and skied some of the taller mountains in Europe. On Saturday, February 18th, 1978, Stephen decided that he was going to take a quick little cross-country skiing trip from his apartment down to the coast of Lake Michigan. It was about six miles. And according to the February 21st, 1978 issue of the Greenfield Recorder, which is a Massachusetts newspaper, he had told his friends that he was specifically going to Saugatuck. Stephen's roommate, a Mark Bajer, told police that he had said basically, I'm gonna go skiing, I'm gonna cross-country ski the six miles from our apartment to the lake and then I'll come back. And Mark, when Stephen wasn't back Saturday night, wasn't too concerned. It was when Stephen still didn't return Sunday afternoon that Mark started to think, okay, something might be wrong here, we've got classes tomorrow, we, we can't be doing this. We, we gotta figure out where Stephen is. And keep in mind, it's 1978, so this is before we've got Brandon's Law, which is something we've covered on this channel. If you go back and watch our video on Brandon Swanson, 
Robinson. The police were called within hours of his disappearance and they basically said he's 19, he has a right to be missing. The result of Brandon's disappearance and the fact that he was never found was something called Brandon's Law, which first took effect in Minnesota. It spread nationwide, but what it did was say, hey, if somebody is reported missing, regardless of their age, you must launch the search as soon as possible. That didn't exist in 1978 though, so when Stephen was reported missing, the police just kind of went, okay, well he's 23, He maybe he just decided to go off somewhere and not tell you guys. So when he was reported missing on Sunday, nobody went to go look for him. It was only the next day, Monday, when a couple of people on snowmobiles came across a backpack and a pair of skis on the shore of Lake Michigan that they realized, oh, this is a starting point, let's start looking for Stephen. And things get a little weird here because according to Mark, Stephen's roommate, Stephen enjoyed walking out onto the ice. It was something he liked to do. But according to Stephen's brother, John, if Stephen were to do something like that, he would never leave his backpack behind. He would always carry his backpack with him. Nonetheless, both the skis and the backpack were found on the shore near what is called now Felt Mansion in Saugatuck Dune State Park, and there were tracks that just led right out onto the ice for about 200 yards. One thing that's important to understand about Great Lake ice is that it's not as simple as the lake just freezing over as it would with your local pond. The wave action of these lakes creates 30 to 40 foot tall ice waves, essentially, that have dangerous cracks and crevices and can open up at random times. It's, it's not, you know, you're not going onto the local park ice to skate. It's very dangerous, it's very different. Which may be why there was no sign of Stephen falling through the ice. That's what they thought, at least. There were tracks that led to a certain point and suddenly the tracks disappeared, the ice shifts, maybe it opened up, maybe Stephen fell through a thin patch and it's over. So police immediately theorized the obvious. Stephen walked out onto the ice, stepped onto a thin patch, he fell through, the ice closed back over top of him, he's unfortunately probably dead somewhere in the water. But there was no body and without a body, you can't really say, okay, well, case closed without at least looking for it. So they brought out dogs, snowmobiles, a helicopter, and an airplane to search a three square mile area around the tracks, which is not the biggest search area we've ever seen, but considering that the tracks only went to one spot, you know, there, there were only so many places he could have gone. His parents were also informed pretty much immediately and that led to them flying in from Massachusetts. However, by the 23rd, they really had found absolutely nothing to suggest that Stephen ever made it off the lake. So after the Coast Guard and the state police completed their surveys and their intensive searches via the air, they just decided, you know what, we can't keep devoting resources to this. It's most likely that he's gone, but we'll make sure that everybody knows that we everybody has his face, that the police know to look for this guy during their standard routine patrols. You know, we're not giving up, but we're ending the formal search, the active attempt to find Stephen, because there's just nothing to go on. And much like in the Charles McCuller case that we covered earlier this year, this the, his father spent the entire time flying around looking for him. His dad was involved on foot, on the, in the air. He, he was trying to find his son, and he just couldn't do it. He, he eventually had to head home on Friday. And from there, it was kind of presumed by everybody except Stephen's family that he had walked onto the ice, fallen through a crack, and he was gone. And the way that this was handled was pretty delicate. Hope College did award him his history degree in absentia. It's an honorary degree because he didn't finish the course. But they didn't quite use the term posthumous. It, it wasn't it wasn't after he died, it was just in absentia. And despite the fact that he was kind of presumed dead, his family never had him declared legally dead and there was never an obituary published for Stephen Kabaki. And just to kind of round things out, the police did not suspect any form of foul play and that's likely because there was exactly one set of tracks. And in the following months, the Kabakis, despite there being no reason to hope that Stephen was still alive, continued to be unable to deal with the fact that their son was gone. So what nobody expected was that 14 months after he went missing, Stephen was gonna show up at his aunt's house. On May 5th, 1979, he just showed up in Great Barrington and said, hey, can we call my dad? According to Kabaki, he had simply woken up on a grassy knoll somewhere in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and uh, he walked over and asked somebody where he was and what day it was, and that's when it started to come back to him that he had been missing. And of course, he didn't totally remember what had happened, but this was kind of the moment where he was like, right, I was out on the ice, and now I'm here. To quote him, he said, I was lying on the grass in a meadow when I woke up. I didn't know where I was. I was wearing clothes that weren't mine. And most importantly, Stephen had no memory of where he was, what he did, anything from the time period where he was just missing. He said, I was confused by all the hugging and kissing. 
I didn't feel like I had been gone that long. To him, it was like those 14 months never happened. He had complete amnesia. And he said that the last thing he remembered was darkness, cold, and the fear of being lost out on the lake. So he, he was not in some sort of state when he went onto the lake. It's just that at some point on the lake, something snapped and he went into a completely different mindset. And he only knew that a year had passed, that a full 14 months had passed since he disappeared because he picked up a newspaper and saw the date. That was how he knew. Now, he may have found it interesting when reading through the papers and talking to everybody about his disappearance and the time he spent away that at one point he was a suspected victim of John Wayne Gacy. There wasn't really much to go on. You gotta remember that this is 1978. Nobody's got cell phones. There's not cameras everywhere. There was basically no way to know where Stephen was unless he signed his name on something. But there were some clues in his backpack that told people where he might have been. Among those were a shirt from a Wisconsin marathon, some maps from California, and a pair of running shoes. And on top of the running shoes, the maps of California, and the marathon shirt, Stephen also said, I feel like I've done a lot of running which would imply that he did a lot of running. He wasn't sure how he got the Wisconsin Marathon shirt, though. He doesn't remember running a marathon, he just had a shirt from Wisconsin Marathon. Additionally, it seems that he hitchhiked most of his way around the country. How he survived for 14 months with ostensibly no money is hard to figure out, but he seems to have at least gotten around by just hitching rides, again, 70s. And he had a couple of signs about hitchhiking that made it clear that he had, at, very, at the very least for some portions of this trip, been catching rides with people. And what's astonishing about it is that he managed to get from Michigan to California like that, and then back to Massachusetts. So he crossed the country twice, without money. How? But there's something else that's, that's weird about this story. I think that for most people, if we disappeared for an entire year and had complete amnesia, didn't know anything that happened, we'd probably want to know what happened, right? We'd be curious. We'd think, hey, I'd, I'd like to fill in these gaps. If, if only to know that we didn't do anything illegal during that time period that we could have coming back to haunt us later, right? With Steven, that wasn't the case. He had zero interest in tracing his life during that time period. He just wanted to let it go. It was something that happened. It was gone. A year of his life disappeared. It's over. Not interested. And you might think, well, maybe Maybe he disappeared deliberately and the reason he didn't want to investigate is because he already knew what happened. There weren't really any reasons that he would want to disappear. He was months from graduating, he had a job offer with a local newspaper, he had a girlfriend in Germany, and his dad was gonna sign over the family home to him. So, couple of possibilities. This could have been him panicking about his life, you know, suddenly starting and being an adult and him deciding, I need to go disappear for a year. But also, that's a lot of stuff to give up just because you're a little worried when there are other options like trying to find a different job or not taking the house from your dad or breaking up with your German girlfriend. Like, there, there were other options short of disappear for a year. And on top of all of that, he was adamant that he would not see a psychiatrist, which I don't totally understand. So I guess the question is, what, what did happen here? Because after June of 1979, there's not really any reporting on Stephen Kabaki, at least nothing that's not just rehashing what's already known. So it is possible that Stephen did just choose to disappear, that this was his own doing, but again, not a ton of evidence for it. And upon his return, he decided to basically go back and do what he was already doing. He went back to finish his degree, started writing a book of poetry, went back to running six miles a day to keep in shape. He just went back to his old life, so if the intent was to disappear, why just come right back? Alternatively, Stephen had his own theory about what might have happened. He said, The only thing that I can think of is what mountain climbers suffer from loss of body heat and exhaustion. That combination can result in temporary memory loss. But for 14 months, and with complete and total permanent amnesia? And then of course there have been other suggestions that have arisen that are a little bit outside of those two, such as uh, ancient aliens, citing David Politis, saying that maybe Stephen slipped into a portal. And to be clear, Politis says that he had spoken to theoretical physicists who told him this could be the case. He doesn't cite them, but he says that this wasn't a theory he came up with, but rather he presented some of these cases to uh, theoretical physicists and they said, well, could be portals. And that might sound on its face a little bit ridiculous, but the the science regarding how many dimensions there are and how time works and all of that is still pretty, pretty much in its infancy. We're still working on it. We're seeing weird stuff. I'm not sitting here telling you that there is scientific evidence of portals. I'm just telling you that we're only just starting to understand the possibility of interdimensional realities. 
In fact, if you're religious or you believe in simulation theory, you're, you're basically halfway there already. But if you thought I was gonna hit you with, you know, like an Abrahamic religion, nah, I'm hitting you with Celtic religion. And that's because the Celts had this concept known as the other world that's actually fairly well documented. If we look specifically at the Gaelic Celts, the people of Ireland and later Scotland, we start to see that they have a belief in sort of almost pocket dimensions, places that you can go that are outside of the normal physical world, but not necessarily a united singular other world. We have this kind of binary way of thinking about it due to a Judeo-Christian lens through which we view most religion just because that's what we were raised in, and that's fine. It's just you need to understand that sometimes when you're investigating other stuff, you need to step outside of that boundary and look at things the way the original people probably did, which in this case was that you could sail across the Western Sea, and this would bring you to places like the Land of Youth or the Land of Plenty, if we're following along with the Voyage of Bran, a famous Irish folk story, or you could go through the, the Fairy Mound, the Seed, and this was your way of entering the domain of one of the Tua de Danan. Now these, of course, were sort of, we're, we're not totally sure what the Tua de are supposed to be because the only versions we have of their stories come from Christian sources, that made them more into saint-like or elvish figures than the demigods or gods that they may have been. We do see some similarities between the Tua Dei and continental Celtic gods that imply that the older sources we have from Rome might be a better source in understanding the Gaelic, but again, we're not positive. But in entering through a fairy mound, you could get to the domain of one of these, you know, basically otherworldly princes, and this could be a place, this could be a castle, this could be a manor, this could be an estate. There were a number of different possibilities, and it really depends on which story you read. But what you get is that the other world is a, a place apart from this that also is not one contiguous mass, if that makes sense. And then if we look across the Irish Sea at the Welsh version of this, they see it much more in the binary sense. This other world is another world like our own, a parallel dimension inhabited by people who are parallel to ours. There are kings and lords and countries, and they refer to it as Anun or Anuvan. If you've read the Arthurian legend, this is likely the inspiration for Avalon. There's also often a sort of time dilation that applies to entering the other world in both the Irish and the Welsh, although how exactly the time dilation works is unclear. There are some stories where somebody sails across the Western Sea, goes to the other world, they're gone for hundreds of years, but to them it only feels like a few months. They come back, they step back onto shore, and they immediately ate age all those hundreds of years and basically turn to ash. So sometimes it's a very aggressive sort of time dilation, sometimes you're gone for 10 years. It's not the most consistent thing in the world, but again, these are old oral traditions that were translated into Latin by Catholic priests and then eventually made their way down to us. Unless we find something, some sort of codex from the pre-Christian era, it's unlikely that we're going to understand exactly what the Celts believed in their own words. We'll have to reconstruct it. And it doesn't just stop with the Celts. The Celts have a bit more of a, you know, here's how you get there approach to it. Whereas if we look at some of their European counterparts, like the Norse, there's less uh, detail about how you get to the other realms of Yggdrasil which of course is the giant tree in Norse mythology that makes up Norse cosmology. It's got nine realms. Again, not totally sure what the original nine realms were because most of what we have of it comes from later Christian sources who, though they were doing their best to recount the actual Norse stories, they were in Iceland and a few hundred years removed from, you know, the way that things were done in Norway prior to their encounter with the Christians. But in many stories that involve traversing the various realms of existence, Midgard, Asgard, uh, Alfheim, all of those things, where you get there by traveling across a sea or through a cave or into a dark forest, basically undergoing some sort of journey through some sort of uh, physical, natural boundary before eventually you reach a different land inhabited by different people with different powers and different cultures. And like with Celtic, there are stories that you can get through this Norse tradition, whether you're talking about some of the newer ones or going back to like some of the really ancient ones where time dilation occurs. And if we look at the weirdness of Celtic and Nordic society, it often works in, in tandem with the weirdness of Native American society. And by the way, when I say weirdness here, I'm using that in a very positive term. I'm talking about the, 
the supernatural, the, the cool, the creepy. I don't mean weirdness in a derogatory way. I just want to be very clear about that. I mean good weird. But according to a Deborah Sabo at the Arkansas Archaeological Survey, there are a number of Native American tribes in the southeastern United States that themselves have stories about heroes entering another realm by going through a portal made up of, you know, a certain formation of stones or by going through a, a river or something like that. They just go through a portal, they disappear, they have an adventure, and they come home. Could also look at the Saskets of British Columbia, who we've talked about a number of times, but they are supposedly people who live in caves. Is it that they go through the cave and they end up somewhere else, or is it that they actually live in the cave? <laughs> Again, hard to say, because the only source we really have on it from, from a time when it's helpful comes from 1929, and it was written basically based on the accounts of several non-elders, just people living in the community about their experiences. So it's not quite as, you know, it's not really a, a put together tradition so much as it is witness accounts. So looking at all of that, there's a large number of people historically who have believed that you could slip into another dimension and come back. Does that mean Steven did? It does explain how Steven could walk out onto the ice and just vanish, but it doesn't really explain a couple of other things. Obviously, there's no real reason if that's what happened for the California map or the Wisconsin shirt, unless he teleported to California and then back to Wisconsin. Also, there's really no current scientific backing for that theory. There's some scientific questions being asked, but nothing that amounts to evidence to back that story up. But the answer may rest with another missing 411 case. On February 7th, 2018, so 40 years after Stephen Kabaki's disappearance, Konstantinos Danny Philippidis was skiing with his friends at Whiteface, New York. And as the story goes, it seems that Danny's friends decided that they wanted to hop off the mountain and go get some lunch, it was getting later into the afternoon, and Danny decided that he wanted just one more run before he came in. But hour, hour and a half later, he wasn't back yet, so his friends started looking around for him. They checked the room, he wasn't there, his keys were, so he hadn't driven off, but Danny himself was gone. They called for help, and pretty quickly a search kicked off. And because Danny and his buddies were firefighters, there were a lot of first responders who were immediately getting there to help out. So this included over 250 searchers, drones, because 2018, helicopters, and dog teams, but nobody found any sign of Danny after a full week of searching. Also, it occurs to me that like we should be using drones a lot more in search and rescue missions because it gets rid of all of the danger that a helicopter has. Like We'd be searching for people in horrible conditions. People searched every nook and cranny of that mountain but Danny was not there. And then, on February 13th, Danny, from a new phone number, placed a call to his wife and called her by a nickname, thus she knew it was him. The problem was, Danny was not in New York, and Danny was not in Canada, where he was from, he was a Toronto firefighter. Danny was in Sacramento, California. His wife urged him to call the police, who found Danny alive and well, but interestingly enough, he had gotten a haircut, he had gotten a new phone, and he was still in all of his skiing clothes, including his goggles. He could not tell a soul what happened in those six days. He had no idea. He said as time wore on and they kind of worked with him trying to get his memories back, he remembered things like being in a truck at one point and that he felt like maybe he had gotten a head injury, but that was something the doctors had told him likely happened. He had some ideas about how he had gotten where he went, but nothing really concrete. But unlike Steven, Danny was very interested in figuring out what happened to him during those six days when he was missing. And in an August 2018 interview, he said, says that they believed that he was near the kids' hill when he got disoriented, went for his car, realized it wasn't there, hailed a ride back to town, and he remembers that it was probably in a truck. That's about it. And then he goes on to say that the reason he thinks he sustained a head injury is the doctors said they think he sustained a head injury, not that he himself felt head pain. And as recently as September of 22, according to an article that I read, Danny still has significant gaps in his memory. He has not regained those six days. So doctors suggested that either he had suffered a concussion, which if you're skiing is reasonable, you might fall and hit your head and boom, concussed, or he may have entered a dissociative fugue. And a dissociative fugue or a fugue state can vary in how it presents. Sometimes somebody might just seem like they're a little zoned out, 
a little out of it for a few hours, and then they're back with no memory of what happened, and they might not even realize that at some point during the day, they were dissociating. Often with a short-term one like that, nobody will even notice that something's up. But it can also present as somebody completely changing their personality, disappearing for a few months, and even taking on a new identity. And when it does last for several months, that person will often wander. They will, they will be off somewhere else. And then when the fugue state ends, they typically have complete amnesia, maybe a couple of vague memories, but nothing that really tells them what happened. But the thing about dissociative fugues is that they're typically caused by one of two things, either dissociative identity disorder or dissociative amnesia. Based on the lack of any sign of dissociative identity disorder, also known as split personality disorder, it seems unlikely that that's what caused Danny to go into a dissociative fugue, but there's also no evidence of trauma. That said, it's possible that dissociative fugue has another another cause, other things that lead to it that we just haven't identified or that weren't presented on the Cleveland Clinic website that I read when I was researching dissociative fugue. As far as possible explanations go, a dissociative fugue is, is pretty solid for Danny. We don't necessarily know the cause, but it seems like that would explain pretty fully what happened to him. He was only gone six days. He was... It's entirely possible that he hit his head coming down a mountain. Like, a dissociative fugue seems possible for him. Stephen Kabaki, on the other hand, I was unable to find another case of somebody going into a dissociative fugue for 14 months. That said, a fugue state would explain the wandering and the amnesia, but it still doesn't explain how he got into the middle of the lake and then just vanished. What was he doing? Why was he out there? How did he get back to shore? Did he walk backwards through his own footsteps? How did Stephen go missing from the middle of the lake? So the two big questions that really remain here are, did Steven choose to go missing, and if so, why? And then, if he didn't choose to go missing, how'd the fugue last so long, and how did he vanish from the middle of a lake? And I guess I'll add one more in there, which was, how did nobody come forward? His case was national news, his face was in numerous newspapers all over the country, how did nobody recognize Stephen Kabaki for that entire 14 months? To be honest, I don't have an answer. I looked at this in from, from every possible angle I could, and there's no solution that I found based on publicly available information that really covers the entire spread here. Because even if Stephen did choose to disappear, even if he did lie about forgetting everything, how did he disappear from the middle of the lake? Did he walk backwards, perfectly placing his feet into his own tracks for a full 200 yards? Did police just not notice that the tracks were going the wrong way at some point? Also, how'd he get out of there without any skis or belongings? Like, he didn't bring his wallet. He had nothing. Actually, I think he did have his wallet, now that I'm thinking about it. He did have his wallet. Which actually makes it even worse, because if he at any point tried to buy alcohol or cigarettes or anything requiring an ID, somebody should have seen the name Stephen Kabaki and gone, oh, the missing guy. Again, maybe I'm just overestimating how aware people were of what was in their newspaper back in the 70s, but I know that if I was watching the news and I saw a guy's face and it said, this guy's missing, and then I saw that guy, I would probably, you know. But, you know, there, there are often videos where we do, we come up to a conclusion or we say, we don't know how this works, and one of you guys has an answer. So, we actually came up with the fugue state thing because that's what somebody suggested on the last video we did that talked about uh, Danny Philippitis. So, I remembered that, I went in, I was like, ah, fugue state, that makes sense, that covers that. So, we actually do look at the comments, we do take your feedback seriously, and if you want to help support what we're doing here at the channel, you can subscribe to our Patreon for just $1 a month, you can also become a member here on YouTube, you can also check out our merch store at thelorelodge.shop. We also discuss these topics live on a podcast, and that is Sunday nights at 7 p.m. every weekend. And if you want to stay awake while we do it, we of course have our coffee that is from Tableau Roasting Company. It is delicious. I designed it myself. And you can also get coffee from other content creators like Stakuyi. And a quick reminder before I go, check out our sponsor Factor at factor75.com and use code LORELODGE50 for 50% off of your first box. I really like the meals and I think you will too. With all that out of the way, this is the end of the video. It is time to go. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Aiden Mattis and thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.